Hackintosh, Mac Pro, Power Mac. What do these three systems have in common? They all use standard mechanical hard drives. Now, I know it sounds crazy, if not insane, to still use mechanical hard drives considering there's so many other solid state alternatives nowadays, but you gotta keep in mind that this is from 2004, this is from 2006, and this is from 2010. Now, I'm not saying that these are not able to run a newer version of Windows or Mac OS. They definitely can if you want to patch it onto the system. But considering we're using old Mac OS, which was also around when hard drives were still the main storage medium, then it's perfectly fine to use because, honestly, you can't really tell that these are actually running on a hard drive. Now, there are some use cases where an SSD or something like that would be way faster, especially for things like Spotlight. But usually for just basic day-to-day -day usage, a hard drive is more than capable on older systems and older software. I know that hard drives are not perfect, but then again, flash storage isn't perfect either. I have way more hard drives. They've worked well for me in the past, and I'm going to continue to use them because why not? They still have a decent amount of storage available. That being said though, I have upgraded other systems in the past, such as this Dell Optiplex off to the side, because, let's face it, even I know that Windows 10 on a hard drive is not a fun experience. We have upgraded the storage on both of these systems in the past. This went from nothing to 3 terabytes. This went from just the stock 250 gig hard drive to that, as well as a 1 terabyte hard drive. But when it comes to the storage on the Hackintosh, which the main point of it is to use as a server, it only has one 250 gig hard drive. Now this does have a 7200 RPM drive, which is great because, well, it's faster. And if I was only using this as a standard Hackintosh, a 250 gig drive like this would actually be pretty decent. Again, I'm speaking in terms of old software and old Mac OS. I know that nowadays it's not that much storage, but it's still better than nothing. So if this is working out so well for storage, why not just fill up the hard drive before having to upgrade the system itself? Well, you see, I started to use it like that, and then I realized, oh no. What if something actually happens to the hard drive, the Mac OS install? If something bad happens and all the files are on the same hard drive, well, you can just imagine that it's not going to be super fun to get those files back, if it's even possible in the first place. We're still going to keep this 250 gig hard drive within the Hackintosh here because, well, Mac OS is running on this in the first place and it still works. But we're also going to upgrade the Hackintosh itself with this right here. I know, hilarious, right? A laptop style drive within a desktop. But it actually makes sense because we don't have that much spare room to work with inside the desktop because it's a slim form factor PC. And out of all the hard drives that I have, I probably have the most in this style the 2.5 inch laptop style drives. And considering this is actually a 1.5 terabyte hard drive, that's a lot of spare storage to have inside a server. And yes, I know it's only a 5400 RPM drive, but you know what? I don't care. Considering I'm not using this anywhere, it's basically free storage. So let's get the Hackintosh out of here and see how professionally we can install the hard drive. Oh yeah, of course, we also have to unplug all the cables. There we go. I know it seems like we don't have a lot of space inside, but we can definitely work with this. There's actually an extra expansion slot underneath the DVD drive. Now typically that would be for a floppy drive if the hardware actually supports it, or you could also install something like a multi-format card reader. But in this case, because we don't have anything installed at the moment, but we still have that space available, even though it may not be enough space for a standard hard drive, because this is a 2.5 inch drive, we can definitely install this, no problem, and we'll still have space for airflow. Now the bad news about this setup though is that even though we do have a spare SATA connection on the board, we can't really make use of it because there's no extra SATA connections on the power supply. Now we do of course have a 4 pin connection here, which is for, again, something like a floppy drive or a card reader. But obviously this is not SATA, it's a 4-pin connector. Now, I'm sure I could get an adapter for this, or I even have one sitting around in a PC tower somewhere, but until I find it, or get one specifically for the Dell, we're just going to power up the hard drive with the cables from the optical drive. Now, I wanted to keep this connected up to the Dell, because having a spare optical drive is always nice, 
But in this case, because we also have the Mac Pro and the G5 right next to this system, it really doesn't matter because those machines already have optical drives. And of course, we have even more systems like the other Dell Optiplex with Windows 10, which also has an optical drive ready to go. So yes, this would be a possible upgrade path in the future. But in this case, I think that storage is more important because again, this is of course a Mac OS server. So with the cables unplugged, we can just remove the drive out of the Dell. And as you can see, we have a lot of space to work with. And just because this will not be usable, at least for now, it doesn't mean that we won't reinstall it, because if we don't, we'll just have some extra space here, which really doesn't look all that great. It's entirely possible that there's a second hard drive caddy for a model of Optiplex like this, such as how this drive is installed, but because we don't have anything like that, we're going for another professional solution. CAD. Cardboard Aided Design. This is so that the other hard drive here doesn't sit on top of the main boot drive. And even though it isn't really like the best permanent solution, it'll work for now. And as for heat, honestly, this system really isn't like being used in a super intensive way. It doesn't generate a lot of heat. I guess it is still a concern, but I'm also not leaving this system on 24 seven, really only when I'm using it. Now that right there is one clean setup. Just look at all that cable management. Now, if I was using this in a vertical orientation, I'd probably try to make it so it doesn't really move that much, but we're not. We're using it like this, so it really doesn't matter. So let's go ahead and reinstall the optical drive. And just like that, we now have an even more upgraded server. So we're in the BIOS here because I want to double check that it actually shows up and it should be under drives here. And here it is, 1.5 terabytes. Awesome. So you can actually see we have a Windows install on here. Now the story behind this drive is that I actually used this with a Windows laptop in the past because I thought I would actually be able to use it for something and well I just never got around to actually making use of it. It was installed inside of a laptop and then it just sat around and then I removed it from the laptop and it still sat around. So. Now we actually have it inside the Optiplex and we get to do all the awesome cool Mac OS side of things here by actually making use of disk utility. So it does show up on the desktop. Again, it does have a Windows install, but there's really nothing on it. It's just a standard Windows 7 installation. And here it is, untitled. Now, I guess if we really wanted to, we could keep the Windows install, but I just don't need it on the system. Besides, the install is not optimized for this desktop, so all we need to do is erase the drive here, configure it for macOS, but at the same time, I also have an idea on how to actually partition this. Now we could do this real simple by just having one partition and have the entire drive available for storage, but I think the best way to make use of this drive is to actually partition it with three separate partitions. The reason why is because we could actually have one 250 gig partition here to act as a time machine backup. So that way the internal hard drive, specifically the boot drive, would be backed onto another hard drive and we would be left with two separate partitions. We can have one specifically for storage and the other one would be for net booting devices. So considering how we wanna use the system, I think this makes the most amount of sense here. It's obviously all set to GUID partition table and macOS extended journaled because, well, it's macOS. And we have specifically three separate partitions all with a different size. Now, macOS file server, it's called that and it's not specifically macOS 10 file server because if we want to use something like macOS 9 in the future or even something older, we can have all the macOS applications, files, utilities, whatever, all on this partition right here. Now the second one here is macOS Netboot. This is awesome because we can actually have separate macOS installs on this drive. And basically, if the system is connected to the network, we can boot the system, even if it doesn't have an internal hard drive, from the network directly. So we could have copies of all the early versions of Mac OS 10 up to Lion basically, and even Mac OS 9. I think that 500 gigabytes is enough storage for this because it's not gonna be like the main drive, but it'll be an easy way to actually set up the system, use it, maybe copy over the install, 
And the last one here is Lion Server Time Machine. Now this is set to 250 because that's what we have inside the system itself. So this will basically just copy whatever is on the actual boot drive here, Optiplex Lion Server. Now it probably could be less, but I maxed it out to the actual potential of the hard drive because if we actually make use of the internal boot drive, it's nice to have a complete backup and not worry about the storage here. So with all of this configured, we just need to click apply, partition, and with that complete, we can zoom out here and see the new drives on the desktop. Now for the awesome part, we can go into system preferences, time machine, and just look at that. That is such a cool icon to see. We can go into select disk here, select our time machine partition, and it actually sees my time capsule on the network, which is really cool, but we're just going to ignore that for now. So we will select this as the backup, and this basically says that it's on the same drive as the file server and netboot partition, but we're just going to select to use it anyways. So this is now on. We have Time Machine up here. So because this is a fresh copy of Lion, essentially, we just have the server installed with all the updates and things like that. It doesn't have too much to back up. It's also really cool to see that the icon actually changed to a Time Machine icon. And we can see that it's now preparing the backup. It's kind of crazy to think that this was released with macOS Leopard, which is supported on PowerPC. Time Machine is just a really awesome feature to have. And I mean, just look at the animation here. This is so cool to see. So at this point, we actually have several backups onto the Time Machine. And in fact, a new one is actually starting. But if we go into Time Machine itself, do I even have to explain anything? This is what we had in the past. This was all over the place and now it's gone. Just look at this design language. This is unbelievable. It's like you're actually going back in time here. Even though I've used Lion and other old versions of macOS which support Time Machine, I've never really properly used it until now. Now I use Time Machine, or at least I make backups of it on my main Mac Mini, but that's running macOS Big Sur. And as you can imagine, we don't have anything like this design. When we set up Time Machine, because we didn't change any of the options, it's actually backing up all three of the partitions. Now, it probably doesn't really make that much sense considering these two are on the same hard drive as the Time Machine backup itself, but considering we don't really have anything on the hard drives as of yet, I'm probably just going to leave it as is. Once we actually start to fill up the hard drives though and run low on storage, then I'll probably remove them from the backups itself and just keep the Optiplex backup. So we know the hard drive actually works. We have three new partitions here on the Hackintosh. Time Machine actually works as intended. All we have to do now is transfer over some files, right? Now I do have some kind of file organization on the Mac Pro and even on the G5, but it definitely could be better. There's room for improvement. So considering we're starting off fresh here, I think it's a good opportunity to make it better because we have Mac OS 9 here. Even though I'm not using this right now and I don't have anything archived in terms of Mac OS 9, I still think it's a good idea to be ready for when we actually get to this. We have Mac OS 10 over here, and when it comes to universal and power PC applications, I think that the best approach here is to actually have a separate notepad file for whatever specific application it is, which has a compatibility list, essentially just a detailed list of whatever the specific application needs, because if you integrate all the information within the name of the folder itself, it's going to get real cluttered real fast. Previously, I would also only download the specific version of whatever app I need for the specific Mac OS version, but starting with this, if there's actually an application which has multiple downloads for Mac OS 9, Mac OS 10, multiple versions of Mac OS 10, so maybe like the last release for Tiger, the last release for Leopard, if there's anything like that, I'm going to download every single version so I have it easily accessible, especially if it's an application that I know I'll use. So USB Overdrive is a simple application which lets you configure different USB accessories, and there's versions of this going back to Mac OS 8. Now, considering this also works under Mac OS 9, I guess for now I'll have it within the Mac OS 9 directory, but there's also a version here for Mac OS 10. So essentially, it'll basically be a local archive, and it'll all be easily accessible on this server machine. Now, when it comes to Mac OS 8, I mean, I don't have anything Mac OS 9 related, like I said. I still will specify if it works, but I guess in the future we could also just make some more folders for Mac OS 8. We gotta get to that point, though. 
We need more Macintoshes for that. And as for the actual installers themselves, now even though I had some of these, I didn't have one for every single version of macOS 10, let alone macOS 9. Now of course the fact that we are using macOS Lion is kind of an important factor because, well, you know, it's older macOS. And just like with the applications, we will have dedicated information for the installers directly. So is it like a retail copy, a server edition? Is it a completely stock launch version with no updates? Now this is going to be really awesome to use and not to mention extremely convenient once it's all set up here. But considering we also have server, I think it would be really cool if we could actually make use of the wiki functionality. Now I'm not entirely sure how this will actually work yet. But basically, if we could just take all the information from these folders here and copy it over to the wiki, then that means we could easily access the wiki with all the information about the installers and applications that we have on the local network. Now, it will take a while to set this up, but this is just another way of how we can actually make use of the server application and make our Hackintosh server that much better. So we now have some new files here on the hard drive and these are actually from Macintosh Garden because when it comes to the earliest versions of OS X, basically 10.0 all the way to 10.4 Tiger, I really didn't have anything installed at all. So now we actually have it on the system here and even though it looks messy, the file management is obviously not how I want this to be long term. We're still going to test this out by taking all these files, putting it into the installers folder and sharing this on the network to see if it actually works in the first place. So we will try this out on the G5, and as for file sharing, wait for this to make a new SharePoint. So if we go into the settings, we can see it's obviously the installers folder. So let's turn this on and see if we can access those installers. The G5 is actually connected up to this airport, and the other one is for the Mac Pro and the Hackintosh. Now just for testing, It'll actually be a wireless transfer between both of the airports. Now, I know it's not ideal, especially if we're doing something more serious, like actually making macOS installers or even netbooting the system. We can always just install an Ethernet cable between both of the machines here. But at least it also means that we have multiple ways to access the network. So at the desktop here on the G5, we just need to go into Finder, take a look at the shared section, and we can see our network right here. And there it is, the Optiplex is on the G5, so this means that as long as we have a proper login, we can access anything that we actually configure within server. And we can check out our new folder, macOS installers. And for the final test in terms of will it actually work as a file server, can we copy this onto the desktop? I would say that's an awesome success. I'm really happy with how this server setup is turning out to be because we now not only have an upgraded GPU, we have even more storage available. And even though we lost out on the optical drive, we could always restore it if we get a 4-pin to SATA adapter so we can actually make use of that free connection on the power supply. And of course, we cannot forget about server because this app is super cool. It is so nice to finally have this backed up because it's time machine. Hopefully something doesn't happen but at least we know that the boot device here for Lion is actually safe. I guess it is possible to speedrun Time Machine because, well, the backup is now completely full. Now, considering we were backing up all three of the partitions here, I guess it does make sense, but we're actually in the future right now where I've been transferring over macOS installers, combo and security updates, and macOS applications onto the file server partition, and this took, like, no time at all. Like, it's actually hilarious to see how fast this actually ran out of storage. There's only five gigabytes left on the partition. For comparison, the Optiplex drive is only taking around 15 gigabytes, and the file server is, well, taking up everything else. I guess it does take a lot of storage if you have everything from 10.0 all the way to 10.12 Sierra. Now we can actually use Time Machine again. I will say though that this wasn't completely for nothing because it was actually a pretty good stress test. If it can simultaneously back up the same partition onto itself while downloading multiple macOS installers at the same time, then I would say we have a very good hard drive here for the server. If you enjoyed today's video, then consider leaving a thumbs up. And if you want to see even more awesome content about macOS server, old macOS, cool things like that, then consider subscribing. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.